Okay. Now some some more people are joining. Let's just wait uh, some more uh, minutes. Simone. Okay, guys. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Sorry for the delay. A couple of minutes we will start. Thank you. I will introduce you, Ivan. I will introduce you all the special guests of today. And we will be ready to start. Um, I see there's uh, 19. Okay, so let's wait uh, a couple of minutes again and then we will start together. <clears throat> in fact i was a little bit worried about the fact that uh, a lot of people try to go inside and then uh, nothing but uh, at the end we manage Simone, uh, you're in mute. We are not uh, hearing you. I don't know if someone, uh, because I was muted too, maybe uh, someone muted us. Now I see that your microphone is on. Perfect. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yeah, all good. I can see you. I can hear you. Okay. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm really glad to have uh, this second opening session uh, from uh, ATB community. We are uh, also in, in a direct with uh, Instagram, so uh, let's, uh, let's uh, follow. Okay. So today, today we will speak about uh, the e-commerce. We will have an uh, important guest that uh, is mastering uh, the e-commerce platform that are becoming uh, so much important also during uh, this period of coronavirus. Uh, before uh, introduce the guest and all the guys that are working with me in the in this uh, this community, I will say just uh, just two words about ATB. And uh, for the ones that is the first time that join uh, join uh, join us, okay. So ATB community born uh, just uh, um, one month ago from uh, one idea that uh, was uh, um, that was developed during uh, during uh, the last period. So the fact I want to uh, create a community to share ideas, to share opinion, and to grow a relation and become more and more and more important. Uh, so our idea is to stress the value of sharing, okay? So um, there's, uh, there's a LinkedIn page, there's uh, a number of people 
in the community that is growing faster. We are really happy to have you here and to, to share uh, ideas, insight, and uh, more and more. So we are completely open to have uh, a new possibility of business with all of you and new possibility of topics. So today we will speak about e-commerce. I will let uh, I will let the word to, to Ivan, my my co-owner, co co I would say, that is working with me and another couple of guys. Um, and uh, I hope uh, I hope you have the best uh, opportunity with us and uh, hope you to see again in all of uh, our um, uh, period and our experiences. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Simone, for the introduction. I would like to give you a warm welcome to this edition of uh, ATB. And uh, what we are going to address today is uh, the e-commerce and how this phenomenon is uh, changing and shaping the world uh, we are in. So today we have uh, Benedetta Gasparini, uh, which will introduce us uh, to the main differences between uh, uh, um, local, uh, real, physical shop uh, and an e-commerce. And uh, a point that I think that will be especially interesting is the one related to the effect that uh, COVID-19 has on the world of commerce and uh, on the future developments of e-commerce and which technologies can get together to make these uh, uh, totally new product and experience for uh, all one. So, uh, without uh, much further ado, I would like to give the word to Benedetta. If you want to please uh, start to share your screen so that we make sure yes. that everything is. Hi, everybody. Sorry. 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 Can you all see that? Uh, yes, we can see you. Okay, perfect. So, uh, my name is... Uh, thank you to Simone and Ivan for the introduction. So, my name is Benedetta, and I studied marketing in Bocconi University, where, where I had several... Uh, I mean, I had the opportunity to work on several projects uh, in developing uh, e-commerce for some companies. And right now, I'm also working on a side project related to e-commerce, so uh, related also to Amazon, Shopify, etc. So if you will have uh, any questions specific on this topic, I, I think I will be able to answer. But today, um, I would like to give you an overview on how e-commerce has become an integral part of our century and why it has become so successful over uh, the last few years. So why e-commerce? E-commerce is quite an interesting topic, as nowadays we are so used to seeing that we can buy whatever we want online, but there was definitely a period like 10, 20 years ago when things weren't exactly like that. And I remember 10 years ago, people saying that they would never buy a pair of shoes without trying them. But look at today, today e-commerce, for example, Zalando, and how it has become so successful. So the road, as the road to success has been a journey that has lasted for about 25 years. And it started out with a lot of skepticism back in 94, 95, when Amazon and eBay were founded. People thought that e-commerce was kind of like a fairy tale, something so incredible that it could never be part of our everyday lives. And again, it was something so crazy back then. But in the following years, as you can see, the first B2B online services supporting e-commerce started to appear. So, for example, for, from online payment services, global supplier services such as Alibaba, online advertising services, etc. And then... Benedetta, excuse me for the interruption, but uh, maybe since we're new to this platform, we had a problem with uh, sharing your screen. And at the moment, uh, uh, I will uh, just like to ask you if you can try to share again your screen, make sure that the presentation is selected while you share. Uh, okay, it's not working. Yes, maybe you can quit and try again, and then we can uh, 
go on with the presentation, which uh, I'm sure it will add more value of what you're saying. But uh, did you see the first slide or or not? Because I uh, maybe we can have uh, also feedback from uh, from the community. Do you do you see something we can uh, pick up? Or? Uh, I could uh, I could I could see the slides uh, perfectly. I think uh, I think most of us could. I think it's just maybe one or two people could. It might not so be you. It might be them. So. <laughs> okay, let's go on then. Sorry for the interruption. Yes, I do agree with material. Thanks. Thanks for the feedback. Do you see now the 25 years yeah, journey like I can see it. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so maybe if you don't see it, don't see it, say, say it to me. So I was saying that um, after the first two, uh, so after the first uh, global services for e-commerce, also like uh, the first platforms such as Wix.com, Shopify, Etsy started to come out, and year after year. The consequences were that all the brands that we already know, the, the well-known brands uh, such as Coca-Cola, Ikea, and all those all those famous brands, started to integrate their online presence by opening an, an online store and uh, like uh, having their channel online. On the other side, little entrepreneurs and vendors started to join more and more uh, extensive, extensive marketplace, for example, Amazon and eBay. But the major shift for e-commerce happened around 2014, 2015, when the sudden increase of mobile application usage allowed customers to buy whatever they wanted and in any place, basically. So here we come today. We can buy anything at any time and any, at any place. I've uh, tried to gather some statistics which support, uh, again, the rising and the trends of uh, e-commerce with some insights on the future. So as you can see here, we have we are today over 2 billion buyers worldwide and the biggest market for e-commerce is China, right after the USA market basically. But one of the most relevant prediction is that analysts say that in 20 years, 95% of purchases will be made, will be made sorry, exclusively online. And that is likely going to be possible since our generation, which is the millennial generation, and the generation X, which is the generation right after, mainly buy online. So it is possible that by 2040, we will be the majority out there. And so it is possible that we will still buy prevalently online. So why e-commerce have been so successful over the last 20 years? I've gathered economics and business related factors so basically factors which are related to how, you're, how, how you build the business. And on the other side, there are consumer behavior reasons. So how, how your purchasing behavior has basically changed over the years. So by starting with business related reasons, e-commerce has been so successful because the process of owning an online business is so much easier, cheaper, accessible, and more agile compared to the process of like owning a physical shop. I start to summarize all the key elements that differentiate a physical and from an online store. And then I will try to dive into each single process. So first of all, the major difference is that we like with an online store, you build a global brand. So you, you build a brand related to one product or more products or more services, which would reach potentially any region in the world at the same time. And this leads to a basic consequence point, which is scalability. You can basically sell uh, like an unlimited number of products or services in any part of the world. And the more products you sell, the more revenue you get and the more profits you earn. So that's basically uh, the meaning of scalability. On the other side, a physical store relies entirely on its sign and like its local sign and on its position. So the demand of your store is entirely based on the demand of your area and on the number of products that you sell, which are limited to your warehouse and to your physical shop area. One other major difference is that an online store can be fully externalized. As I will show you after, 
you can externalize your inventory, your warehouses, your shipping processes, and even your ad advertising. This means that most of your costs will be variable ones. For example, you can have a product in your store and you can decide you make the platform sell it for you and ship it directly to the customer. So you will pay the fees, basically the selling fees and the shipment fees only if you sell. If you don't sell, you will not pay them. On the other side, a physical store can't be fully externalized unless it is completely automated. You need salespeople, you need uh, to manage warehouses, you need to manage inventory, you need to pay the rent, and all these activities are fixed costs that, that you pay even if you don't sell. So overall, an online store is linear, and as it is virtual, of course, and it can be managed anywhere, uh, while an online, while an offline sorry, shop is a completely like attached to its physical position. So diving into each single process, I would like to give you a sort of step-by-step -step procedure that will help you understand why e-commerce are definitely more convenient for a business owner. So in order to open a physical store, you need to, first of all, get a license and pay for it. And the bigger the store is, the more you will need to pay and the more the bureaucracy gets tougher. Then you need to choose the right place. Again, position is essential. If you, if you fail the position, you fail your whole business. And based on the position chosen, you will need to pay a fixed rental, which starts, which starts around, uh, yes, about 500 per month. It depends on your position, of course, and which is the first fixed cost you have. Then you will need to hire one or more sales assistants because you can do any you can do everything alone and they have salaries so you you will need to of course to pay their their salaries and and those salaries are again fixed costs you will need to order a minimum quantity of inventory so you will need to invest a lot of money but at the same time your inventory is limited and related to the space that you have in your shop so again it is not scalable you will also have uh, other fixed costs such as equipment, warehouse costs, and maintenance costs, which are again like costs that recur every month. So you need to pay them every month. Advertising is quite difficult also and expensive nowadays if you're like doing it only offline. You should rely a lot of uh, sorry, you should rely a lot on world of mouth and uh, like all the people that are surrounding your area in order to contain the expenses uh, of other form of advertising. And also if the demand is absent, like we are living today, uh, demand uh, is not buying in physical stores, you have to close because by closing you can avoid some fixed costs. Uh, of course, there are still some fixed costs that you have to pay like rental, but if you, if you close when you don't have demand, you will save a little money. Now let's take a look on how it is much easier to build an online store. So first of all, you register your brand and your products related to your brand. And once you have registered your brand, you can sell unlimited products related to that brand. Secondly, you choose a platform. There are so many platforms out there and they offer you retail and sales services and the most famous right now is Shopify and which is a uh, again an e-commerce uh, company rising every every year and this platform will do mo the most of the most of the work for you it will manage your inventory your sales automation the website maintenance and your administrative expenses and by doing all of that it will cost you less than 100 euros per month so you won't you won't need sales assistance you will need six website damages you won't need inventory management and the interesting part is that you won't even need a warehouse in fact uh, with e-commerce it is possible to take advantage of an omni-channel fulfillment strategy which means 
that you can rely on companies that are doing this better than you. For example, Amazon, eBay, DHL, DHL, sorry, which will manage your inventory and shipments directly to the customers. And all these costs will be transformed from fixed costs to variable costs, which means again that you will pay them only if you sell. So with few money, you can also graphically manage your, your store once in a while when you, when you need to. And you can also potentially reach thousands and thousands of people with online advertising on, on Facebook or on social media. Lastly, the big difference is that an online store can stay open 24 hours and seven days out of seven days. So even if you're not selling, uh, you can still uh, maintain your store open because the fixed costs are so low. So we have seen why for a business owner, building an e-commerce has many more advantages, but there is also something to be said about the change of the demand and of our consumer behaviors over the last 20 years. Our, our behavior has changed really much. And in order to explain this, I took the classic marketing funnel model. And for those who don't know what it is, it is a model that basically explains all the steps that intercourse before a purchase. So the first phase of the marketing funnel is so-called awareness. Before, so in the past, we used to be more reactive to the company's advertising and messages. Those companies were pushing us a message and we were passive in receiving it. Then in the phase of like consideration, so-called consideration, so in the phase uh, in which we thought, okay, let's know more about it, uh, more about this product or these services, we used to basically rely only on our friends and relative suggestions. Finally, if we really did like the product, we went to a store, maybe trying or seeing better the product, maybe purchasing or, or maybe not. And we were used to spend so much time in our stores. And definitely today is not like that. And today the process is definitely different. Uh, in the first phase of our consumer process, we start searching contents. Contents are basically news, blogs, YouTube videos, social media posts. And we search them because we are interested in a, a general topic. Then, like, what happens? It happens that we are, some of, some of us are exposed to online ad advertising based on our interests, or some of us see a certain brand in a poster or in a video, or um, like in whatever content of the people that we follow online. So we start our online researches by, se sorry, by seeing YouTube reviews, um, influencer reviews, five-star reviews, or even we try to find bad reviews. And after all this process, if we really want the product, we don't lose that much time. We just save it into our cart and we buy it or we save it, we save it for later. In both cases, the process of purchasing is extremely fast and time-saving compared to the past, so compared to the time we used to spend in a physical store. Why? This is so relevant today. During this last period, we have been forced to stay at home, while many businesses and physical shops were forced, were forced to close. But even if we are at home, we still need to buy food, basic necessities and hobby related items, you know, for example, um, fitness furniture or books. So definitely COVID-19 had an impact on both e-commerce and social behavior. I have put here two graphs which summarize, which summarize the major KPI of e-commerce evolution over the last two months. And thanks to the statistics made by Content Square, which is a platform that collects a huge database of e-commerce worldwide, um, I was able to gather these insights. So as we can see from the graphs, and we can see it here uh, in the second graph, um, e-commerce transaction had a surge around the last week of March. And the worldwide transaction increased about 
25% firstly, and then 45% overall, consider, considering also April. Also, we can see he here in the first graph that not only basic necessities demand has increased, but, but, the, but also the demand of retail technologies, cosmetics, fashion, and sport equipment. There was a moment during March when Amazon warehouses were so overwhelmed by requests that they needed to block some inventories of vendors who were not selling first necessities products. So basically the two main consequences of this period and of COVID-19 for e-commerce were first of all that online vendors have become richer on one side and on the other side that the delivery sector has shown a huge gap between offer, uh, sorry, between offer and actual demand. And, but there are, there are not only economic uh, impacts, but also so social impacts of COVID-19 have been huge. And the first big social impact is that going back to old normality is for us a switching cost, which means that we are now used to buy online and we wait for the things to come to our houses and we have created this habit. And it is unlikely that we are going back to spend our weekends to go shopping in a store. The second fact is that it is also true that as human beings we are designed to get used to things and we got used also to social distancing. And this will certainly, will certainly reflect on our fears to go out and to spend our time in close place and with a lot of people surrounding us. So it is more likely that we will prefer to spend the time with our friends outside rather than being close in a shop. The third interesting fact is that in this period, in some countries, for example, Italy, a new demand of online consumers has been created. And this new demand will not disappear after COVID-19. Uh, it will be mixed to the already existing demand. And lastly, uh, there, this is a period that is really uncertain for local stores and shops. So the big question is, they, will they be able to open again with low demand and so much fixed cost to be paid? And if they will be able to open again, will they be able to reinvent themselves? And this turns out to be an interesting point for the future because automation will certainly improve the whole e-commerce system by like for example adding artificial intelligence for customer assistance augmented reality on the website for better user experience drones for deliveries and shipment blockchain for more secure payments and a better managed supply chain so with like all of these improvements on e-commerce side it's clear that physical store will need to build an experience to reinvent themselves. They will need to build something in which the customers will rather spend their time, even without like purchasing directly in the store. And this is probably the only way physical shops and store will be able to survive. So as a conclusion, I would say that e-commerce is like the picture of our era and of our world, which is changing faster and faster. And it, it is not uh, like a surprise if maybe in 20 years we will see the business and the commerce paradigm completely change. So uh, we will see, for example, shops in the street which are experienced shop, shops or shops uh, replaced with houses and that will buy basically uh, online, uh, all of our purchases. So thank you very much for listening. And if you have any question, I'm I'm here to answer. Hope you have enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Benedetta, for uh, your very nice uh, introduction. I see we have uh, a question. So uh, Ale, you can uh, uh, please uh, enable your microphone if you are uh, able. Otherwise, I can. Ale, can you try to open up your microphone? 
maybe there are some technical uh, challenges here. So let's move on with uh, maybe a question from uh, Nicolò Monchiero. Nicolò, can you enable Hi, the microphone? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. Okay. First of all, thank you, Benny, for the presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed the uh, Bocconi marketing style uh, in your PPT. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can it. recognize it. <laughs> Um, yes, it's a mark. Okay. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks again. Uh, my question is, uh, recently I was reading a book, I don't know if you know, Basonomics uh, by the, um, the so-called Brian, the author is Brian Dumain. Uh, so basically in his book, uh, he says that Amazon, the global market share, not only in terms of e-commerce, but in terms of uh, offline and online, so all the market is only 1%, so in all the commerce, uh, let's say, world. Uh, so basically there is a huge potential you mean to grow. In revenue or like in... in uh, yes, I mean, uh, um, the point is that we usually consider uh, the market of Amazon just the e-commerce. But we have to think, uh, let's say, in a perspective uh, that all uh, most of the market uh, that now is offline uh, will be probably online. Okay. Yes. So I, I globally, agree. the the market share of uh, Amazon in the commerce world, let's say, offline plus online, is only one percent. So just to give an idea, uh, Amazon is very big, uh, uh, but uh, still, uh, in my opinion, the, this data shows us that they have uh, still a lot of, uh, let's say, way to grow. So the well, question is... Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. The question is, uh, I, in my opinion, I see a lot of space to grow, but uh, uh, in my view also, we won't have 100% um online okay because there is a limit in the sense that nowadays amazon is leveraging also the fact that uh, you go to a bookshop you see the book then you buy an amazon you know so that we have an omnichannel experience that's that is why they are trying to do in uh, in us with uh, amazon fresh uh, and uh, the amazon stores so do you agree uh, with my consideration that uh, we won't have a 100% online world? Thank yes. You. Yes, I totally agree. As I was like uh, saying here, um, probably most of the stores that will be able to survive will need to or be uh, like on one side very experienced uh, showrooms or on the other side like being only pickup store or just a, a store where you go to see the products and again maybe you can buy there or maybe you can buy online but I think the relevant point is that um, the store will need to add value to the people that go inside and like because we we have less and less time to, to spend on shopping and on purchasing so e-commerce is really fast uh, on one side and but, but on the other side if you go to a store you need to enjoy the process so i think that in the future uh, physical store will need to improve their overall experience and i think they won't disappear and related to your statistics uh, it could be true because um, right now uh, basically e-commerce uh, is uh, around like um, business side I'm talking about around 15% so like uh, of the overall business uh, uh, demand of e-commerce not demand sorry offer so there are a lot of shops that are not uh, um, are not on the online world and uh, uh, they still need to go online and so yes I agree on, on both on both of your statement but I believe that uh, still most of the products will be buy online and that most of the physical shops uh, will have to at least integrate uh, fully an online presence because there are, there are plenty of them that ha hasn't done that yet so uh, I think that they, they will need it uh, they will need to do it I don't know okay I thank you yes <laughs> okay very well now uh, Ali F can try to uh, Exposes a question. If uh, 
Yes, here I am. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Hi. Perfect. Perfect. First of all, hello, Benedetta. Thank you very much for the sharp, precise presentation. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Topic that I think everybody here uh, likes. That's why everybody is here. But going straight to the point, uh, I have two questions actually. I won't, I won't uh, take a lot of time from the others because I saw there are other questions. Like my, my field of studies brings me to ask a question from a strategic and organizational point of view because I was wondering at the beginning when you made the excursions of the, um, how the e-commerce developed throughout the years. During the past, throughout the past 30 years, it increased, it grew, it grew in different ways. So I was a question myself, uh, and it's a question that I, that I ask you, but uh, particularly as uh, I ask it to everybody, like which will be the key factor for an e-commerce to succeed in the future, uh, such as will it be the, um, for example, uh, the way the site is constructed or the differentiation of the product, so the fact that the product is uh, special, unique, or which other type of factors. And yeah, that's the first one. I'll go with the, with the second one eventually. This is a great question. Uh, I, I, I think there are several, uh, I mean, answers to, to this question, but I give you my point of view. And my point of view is that, like, you will need to build a, a, a brand story, which means that you it's of course it's like the the website should be cons well constructed so the website should be clean the process of checkout should be quick so these are considered right now basic uh stuff to to be put in, in an e-commerce i think what will be added in value is that you will need to bring a story for example there is a brand that i recall uh i don't remember how it is called but basically it sells the the shoes made in italy all around the world and they have started out of nothing like uh going around uh with the uh like uh, bargaining bargaining with the, all the uh, little commerces in italy and they created this store and they created this story of the art, I don't know how to say in English, but the artisan, artisan, I don't know, like made made with the uh, manufactured uh, with with hands, and they created all this story, and um, th now they are so famous uh, worldwide. And again, they they choose this message, so they choose uh, we give you the story of our little uh, business owners that build the shoe. Uh, made in Italy, so high quality, high premium quality, and we deliver the message to everyone, and they're having so so much success. So I think that in order to succeed, you will need to uh, like differentiate yourself in this sense. Of course, uh, uh, in order to build, uh, for example, an Amazon brand, you will need uh, so much money and so much extension. Uh, so if you if you have the money and if you have the ambition, you you can do also what Amazon has done. But uh, it's different uh, than I mean I don't know if I explain myself. Uh, it's different saying I want to reach like uh, what Amazon did, or I want to just be successful with with an e-commerce. And I think to be successful with an e-commerce, uh, telling a brand story will be will be the key factor. Get it. No, well, thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll directly connect what you what you just answered to to my second question. Since the, the competition is growing, as you show, as you've shown, and uh, you also mentioned the uh, the coronavirus crisis and all all the the problem is is happening in this industry. I was also wondering and questioning myself uh, where and how will the the industry uh, continue? How will it develop? Because I guess the consumption, the general worldwide consumption is diminishing. So from one hand, people are not going to physical stores, so they might buy something uh, sitting on their sofa. But on the other hand, consumption is uh, um, diminishing again. So 
I don't know which is the balance in this in this in this moment and in the in the short future as as, as well as in the long run. And where do you or you guys in general envision um, the industry going? And perhaps uh, when do you envision it um, going up again? Uh, so yes, like um, we need to distinguish like short term and long term because, of course, in the short term, right now the people that are going to succeed in this business and generally in you know the businesses that are related to commerce are the ones that sell uh, first necessity products, commodities, very low price products. So those. Uh, those businesses in, in this time, I think, for the next year, maybe for the next two years, we, we don't know uh, how the situation uh, will develop. But um, so in the short term, short, medium term, uh, it's true that um, most of the people will have to convert some of, of them inventory or some of the, their products into uh, necessity products, or for example, fashion, or for example, stuff that you uh, still need to buy. For example, also the things for uh, babies uh, or uh, like cosmetics and all those things that people still buy. There, there is a demand of products that still continues. In the long term, I think that the curve will go up again. So the the economic curve, and so I think that in long term. Uh, again, uh, the picture that I envision is that there there will be few marketplace, so few big marketplace. Amazon, I, I don't think Amazon will be the only one. There is uh, Alibaba with AliExpress, uh, which is enter which is entering right now Europe and uh, for directly compete uh, with Amazon. And there is e eBay, who is structuring is uh, its a uh, warehouse system. So there are Shopify, again, another great player that is taking away some shares from Amazon. So I don't think that Amazon will be the only player in the long term. There will be little player, uh, a few player o o owning the, the most of the shares. And there will be lots and lots of little vendors and little businesses, which again, as I uh, said before, will prevail with their story brands and with their products and with their values. So that that's what I, I think. Of course, the future is unpredictable, but uh, I hope I, I've answered to your question. It, it, definitely is, it definitely is unpredictable, but yeah, you, you did definitely answer. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Ale, for this uh, question. I would like uh, to give now the word uh, to uh, Simone Mossa. Let's try to keep our uh, contributions a little bit, uh, say, faster, because we are uh, starting to run out of time. Simone, please. Yes, so can you see me? Uh, I yes. can hear you. OK, perfect. So uh, my, my question, more than a question, was uh, an insight. I just wondering uh, how how much is important for the um, e-commerce uh, platform as Amazon to improve uh, the customer experiences. As an uh, example of what is happening in China, because uh, as you know, probably Alibaba was uh, so much faster and so much uh, uh, skilled than Amazon due to the fact that the Chinese market uh, is uh, considerable. Uh, based on e-commerce. So my question and insight for all of you is what are the main improvement that Thomas can do from the experience point of view and the fact that the user will have more details about the product and maybe some uh, some idea regarding the um, the use of technology. For example, uh, I see a lot of companies that are working with uh, augmented reality. So this kind of uh, improvement, can you can you give us uh, maybe a, a, a feedback also to the other people in the com in the community? Yes. Um, yeah, I think that uh, Amazon has built this success uh, on basically its, its faster delivery. So you are right when you say that. Uh, there are other uh, services and other businesses that should be the focus on Amazon. 
I think that, uh, uh, like in this in this topic, you should be the first first in doing something, and something you should be the first in doing something very good. So, if they are the first in uh, using the drones and and they are effective in it, maybe that will be uh, an advantage. Uh, augmented reality is uh, is uh, cool stuff, and I know that Alibaba is implementing it. And I think it, it should be it should be implemented by Amazon too, but it would be the second. So I think that Amazon should find something where it could be the first, like he did with its really fast delivery. It was the first one, and and it su succeeded in that way. So yeah, maybe I don't know. Uh, maybe the drones uh, will be something that they could do. Yes, it's an open question and open insight for all the people here just to uh, maybe go into, into the details of this point that for me is uh, so much important. Yes. Okay, I think uh, we can uh, move on with the question from uh, Matteo. Oh, hi there. Hi, Benedetta. Thanks for the, for the presentation. It was really insightful. And uh, I echo what uh, Nicola had to say first about your, about your slides. Uh, really like your slides and obviously your content as well. Um, so I think uh, you briefly mentioned that I may have missed uh, missed a bit, but I think you briefly mentioned you've got some experience or you've carried out some projects with uh, e-commerce, etc. cetera. Um, so I just wondered if you could expand on that and uh, I don't know if, if you could let us know what, what kind of things you've done around e-commerce. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this is a, a, a tough question because right now I'm doing a a side project in which I'm basically developing an e-commerce, but I'm I'm not uh, like very open to open up with everything because it is still a uh, an ongoing project and like I, I have a nine to five job, so that's my first uh, priority right now. But yes, basically what I'm doing is try to develop uh, a brand based on uh, an e-commerce so uh, the things that the thing that I can say to you is that I sort of learn how to use the um, Amazon fulfillment services so uh, everyone know uh, know Amazon as a service which uh, of course uh, where you consume things but Amazon has uh, a huge fulfillment services for all the vendors and the great thing about it is that you can deliver the inventory to, to Amazon basically and Amazon uh, delivers for you uh, again the inventory, manage the warehouses, manage your returns uh, and manage uh, the shipment of course uh, directly to the product, to the customer, sorry. So uh, this is the insight that I can give to you and this Fulfillment service of Amazon can be basically linked to be linked to uh, any platform. So if you build a website or if you build a commerce uh, where you put your brand, where you put your products or your services, you can even sell ad advisory. Uh, <laughs> but in this case, we're talking about products. And uh, you can connect the the store directly with the with the Amazon fulfillment. So that's I think one of the greatest that I've learned during the, the process. Thank you, thank you, thanks for your insight. Uh, Benny, before uh, to go on with the questions, since uh, we're talking about the logistic uh, service that Amazon can provide, um, what you were, uh, I want to ask, what you were meaning here in the last slide with the acronym 4PL. We know that uh, 3PL is a third party logistics. So someone that gives you logistic services. Yes. But what is the meaning of 4PL? Well, third party logistics um, are, are not related to your entire supply chain. Mm -hmm. Like they are related to basically shipment and delivery. Uh, sometimes managing of inventory, but 4PL basically means that everything from the uh, from the original um, for, uh, sorry for, from the original I don't have the name right now 
uh, fabric. <laughs> no, it's not fabric. Factory, yes. Sir. Factory, sorry. <laughs> I didn't, have, I didn't recall. So from the factory to the final customers, uh, of course you decide the products, you decide the branding, but the whole process uh, from again of your goods and of your products from the factory directly to the customer is managed by a 4PL. Okay, so maybe Bartolini and uh, uh, companies like that. Uh, yes, Bartolini can make it. For example, if you if you open a store uh, on Shopify and you decide, okay, I don't want to have an inventory, I, uh, I just, uh, I just uh, uh, say to the, uh, to the business, uh, to the factory, uh, I want this product and I want this product like this, and then I would like it to be sell directly to the to the customer. Then Bartolini or uh, other services do it for you. So that, that's a 4PL, like it manages your whole supply chain, I would say, no? Okay, yeah. um, understood. Thanks uh, for the clarification. So we can uh, go on with the questions. Uh, Danny, please. Yo, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, hi, guys. Hi. <laughs> well, welcome. Benedetta, Benedetta, thanks for that presentation. Very informative and insightful. Very Enjoyed it very much. I feel like I'm at university again. Thank uh, you. <laughs> my my question is to do with your um, you were talking about the online store and how it's increased and the physical stores have decreased. So my question was, um, you know, in recent times, global organisations such as Toys R Us um, and Blockbuster they've got, they've filed for bankruptcy and gone out of business because of the increase of um, you know organisations like Netflix and Amazon where you can purchase goods online and much more accessible for us. But well, my question was, um, do you think there is any market or any specific organization that could be a threat of going bust or bankrupt due to the increase of e-commerce and, uh, you know, online stores, if that makes sense? Uh, yes. Do you mean like a big, uh, a big Yeah, yeah. Do, do you think, yeah, yeah, like, do you think, what, what's, what's our risk for going bust, you know, next, essentially? Uh, I've never thought about it. Uh, well, at this time, uh, department stores are really at risk <laughs> because, yeah. uh, uh, like, uh, there is social distancing, so you uh, you, you are not in, like pushed to go there. Do you so think? They, um, sorry, sorry, keep going. No, no. I, <laughs> I, I was going to say, um, do you think you know the food industry potentially because of the rise of things like Uber Eats and Deliveroo? Do you think there's a risk for that, or do you think people will still keep going to restaurants? That that's a good point because uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago we were skeptical that we would uh, buy shoes online again buy clothes so i wouldn't be surprised that uh, the food industry could be transferred online today that there are a lot of skeptical people myself too i i would never buy food online right now i mean food in terms of uh, like always buying food online but um who knows? Yeah, I think uh, I think that I've, I've recently read Selunga, uh, which is a, a Italian food chain, uh, is um, launching some little shops in town, uh, automated. And again, uh, I've I've read it very quickly, but they are sort of uh, giving an experience inside the shops. So I think we can relate to the to this slide again. Uh, I think all, all the industry will have to sort of reinvent themselves, but not just only because of e-commerce rising, but because of COVID-19. They will need to give uh, a sort of uh, why for the people to go to a physical shop. And I think it, the challenge is, uh, is big for, for most of the, the physical stores, the, shop, the, the little shops and, and the big departments. So. Yeah, we will see, but this is an interesting question. Sure, thanks, Nadetta. Thank you, AITB. Thank Give it you. Up. See you. Thank you, Danny, for the participation. Uh, we can go on with the questions. If I'm not wrong, we have uh, Zara. Zara, can you hear us? Zara S. Try to unmute your microphone. Hello. 
sorry, talking to myself on mute. <laughs> Zara, <laughs> Zara from London. Um, although I'd love to be in Italy like most of you guys right now. But um, so my question, I'm so sorry, I was under the impression that you actually had your own e-commerce business, Benedetta. I, I'm sorry if that's wrong, but I don't know if my question is still relevant. So I was going to ask about suppliers. I was going to ask if you knew anything about finding a good supplier and kind of how you could tell a good one from a dodgy one, let's say. And um, when you take a supplier from China, for example, um, who kind of understandably dominate in a lot of areas nowadays in terms of products being sold online, um, if you've had any experience with dealing with Chinese suppliers and kind of their cooperation, is the language barrier a bit of an issue or not really? Um, if you could just specify that sort of thing, if, if you were able to, please. This is a, a super interesting uh, question, Zara, and it seems coming from someone that uh, he's fi uh, that uh, it's thinking to do something. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, please, uh, yeah. I was uh, I was uh, <laughs> thinking the <laughs> thing. <laughs> so Benedetta, please, uh, you can answer to the extent that uh, seems proper to you, of course. Yes. Um, so. Uh, the the only answer to this question is like experience because it can happen to you that at the beginning you uh, start searching for a supplier that like uh, you don't know or you don't trust but after a while so after you like uh, uh, start uh, bargaining and like talking to suppliers you start to get better I would say yes. I had I had the, the opportunity to work also with Chinese uh, people, and it depends on like where you go. If you contract with them, like for example on Alibaba, most of them know English, and I, I would say that that's the first that's the first thing that you should notice yeah. because uh, if they are not talking very well in English, you yeah. should uh, avoid them. So. I uh, should pass to the next one, and also as like every every business, you should rely on reviews on how big they are, how the factory. I, I usually rely on on the numbers also of the of the factory, so I see uh, their catalog if they have a huge catalog or if they have like only ten products <laughs> or yeah. uh, if they have uh, uh, a revenue. A consistent revenue or and if they have been on the marketplace for uh, like five years ten years so mm, yeah makes it, sense. it means that they are solid so, so yeah. where would you find this sort of information is it just like a simple question of google or like is there like a chinese directory of companies or something no, but like that? if you want to if you want to contract with chinese i advise you alibaba is the okay is the, Cool. And is it like, sorry, I keep on interrupting. Or no, like, no, no, no. <laughs> um, is it kind of uh, considered normal or like common practice to suggest amendments to a supplier's uh, product? So, for example, they're selling a kettle in grey and I want them in red. Like, is it considered normal practice? Like, you're free to kind of just ask for as many amendments as you want? And, or is it considered like. Sorry, what do you mean by amendments? Uh, just like, for example, if they had a particular product in a particular way, so if they were selling like a kettle that like only in grey, for example, um, mm -hmm. but I wanted to start selling like red kettles instead, is it kind of considered normal practice to just ask for certain amendments and they just kind of give you an idea of whether they can do it or not? Or is it considered as being like difficult or stuff like that? Again, it depends on the company. I, yeah, I would yeah. suggest okay. you to um, to see it uh, as a, a relevant factor to decide if your company. Most most of them. Uh, I mean, are, you are basically talking about uh, designing a, a product from zero. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. There, there are some there are some companies that do it and some others that don't. Maybe when you start contracting, you can like put it as a, something that you that you want and you, you will see and okay. my, my suggestion is to contact as much people as you can and yeah yeah that makes sense. That, uh, <laughs> thank you so much so you are interested in 
make it oh a hundred percent like yeah. i don't i think it's one of those things that everyone it would spark anyone's interest because it's like why wouldn't you like you would have a, a job for yourself that you can build on your own schedule it's doing something that you like you can align it with your values you know you can sell something good decent i don't know but like it, i think it would spark anyone's interest but maybe the technicalities of it may put people off because it's still quite a new sector and it yeah, takes yeah. a lot of work also okay. it's a business so <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah sorry, <laughs> sorry to interrupt you. maybe this is also the occasion to get in touch uh, via linkedin and uh, to to be more specific and now let's move on with uh, simone uh, I have a question uh, from uh, my friend Angelo that is in the in the call, but is a little bit shy. So uh, my question was basically the fact uh, around uh, the um, luxury world, the luxury market. Do you feel that uh, uh, this company can run uh, a strategic and powerful um, e-commerce strategy, or uh, is still something? Um, probably too too early now to think that company that are uh, like uh, uh, Gucci and other company from luxury world uh, uh, based on the uh, market and the, the property market, I mean physical shop, uh, is something that can be can happen now or is something that uh, you can see in a couple of years? So to shift from the, the shop, the, the present shop to the e-commerce. I think uh, it will be it will be uh, it will be, it will come uh, like in, in, in uh, or if not now I think it has uh, it has to come in two years I, I saw some brands like uh, um, Trussardi Armani which are definitely joining the e-commerce world some of them are even like uh, building their own deliveries like their own branded deliveries. So I think fashion is quite an interesting industry because um, I think they are starting to um, feel that they need to change something. Uh, and I think th this is the, the good change that, that they can make, that they, they can make, sorry. And yes, I think that they should build, again, showrooms for their products, but they should definitely integrate their presence online. With again some, you know, for example, uh, inventing some services, uh, some particular stories, uh, or by adding other services again, for example, uh, to start is adding a delivery uh, with food, so which is branded. So with all of this stuff, you you can yeah. expand your brand and you can succeed. To justify the premium price, I mean, uh, the fact that it's difficult sometimes through the e-commerce justify the, the value that are you delivering uh, without the, the, the person and the fact of the, the shop, okay? It's okay, probably. yeah, yeah, but uh, I think the, the price uh, is uh, related to uh, the, the perception of the brand, is not related on physical store or online store. So I, I don't really understand the question. I mean, do you think that, are you saying that this will impact the perception of the brand? Uh, or I, I don't know if I understand correctly. Yeah, um, probably my question is uh, a little bit weird, but the fact is that I think that uh, uh, for a company as Gucci maybe, uh, the, the fact, the experience that you can, you can have uh, in the shop uh, is part of uh, the, the um, credibility of the price, of the final price. I mean, because uh, it's a luxury shop with uh, a customer journey that you are facing in the shop. So if you uh, take, it, take it over, this experience uh, in the shop, uh, and you change from an e-commerce point of view, are you able to have the same price and to, to uh, give the, the same uh, value to the customer? Yeah, yeah, I understand now. Uh, I think you, you should create an experience also on the, on the online store. So again, by integrating something else, you can maybe integrate uh, a, a packaging uh, like uh, in some way that like makes you feel an experience or an experience directly on the online store. So 
uh, with augmented reality or with stuff like that. So yes, I think uh, that <laughs> like fashion industry sh should start to think about this because their point of uh, um, of like their strong point is uh, the showroom. So uh, they they need to integrate something to like make the same prices for okay. online. This was uh, our uh, last interesting uh, remark. Uh, just to add a little more, I know that in China uh, they are already doing uh, some uh, augmented reality fashion related experiences. Uh, I think in Taobao platform, but uh, this should be verified. Uh, anyhow, uh, for today we closed with uh, all these questions. There has been a lot of uh, interesting uh, ideas. And uh, I think that uh, curiosity was driving uh, also this session. So uh, please, uh, um, just to close up uh, the meeting, I don't know if uh, Simone wants to add something. Yes. Uh, I want to, before to say thank you to all the people that comes today, to say thank you to you, Ivan, and uh, for sure to Benedetta, they gave us a lot of insight, and I think that uh, um, this topic uh, can be um, a drive, I would say, just uh, a, a first point. We will drive again with all of you and uh, probably we will have uh, other guests uh, and uh, we are completely open to your feedback uh, and um, nothing. Uh, please follow us on LinkedIn uh, where we have uh, all the information about the, the community and all the, the feedback. Uh, will be taking consideration for the next uh, next uh, proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benny, for the really nice presentation. And thank you to everyone uh, having questions. Thanks to everyone uh, who was just listening. Thank, thank you so much. Guys. Buon appetito in Italian. Buon appetito. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Ciao, ciao, guys. Thank you.